The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ fill your hearts this day and each day as we look forward to His coming, not only as a babe in the manger, but as He comes again in glory and honor. Amen. There's a great many different responses, and some of which that we've looked at to Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. There's a great many different responses that we're familiar with. There's the response of the shepherds. We understand that idea of kneeling before our King. The response of the angels. Lifting up hands in worship and praise. Even the response of the Magi. We enjoy their response too. Knowing that we would be willing to go that long distance to praise our Lord and to celebrate His birth. But not everybody was happy. And Maybe this is a quick move here, but... As we look at the Christmas story, we see that not everybody celebrated the good news of Christ's birth. As we look at that birth, we see that King Herod and all of Judea with him were terasso, or in other words, they were full of commotion. Their spirits were beside themselves, if you can think about that. And you know what I'm talking about here. You don't really need to imagine it too much because you've been in times in your life where your spirit has been full of commotion, where you've had trouble to even think straight. And this is how Herod responded to the birth of Christ. This was how he welcomed this new king. In a manner of speaking, he really did not welcome the new king, did he? If anything, he w- his response was, was one of violence, one of fear. And take, Let's take a minute to look at who Herod was. Herod was known as Herod the Great. His reign was from 37 B.C. to 4, or to, to, to 4 B.C. So he had almost a 40-year reign there little over between 30 and 40 years. And as he reigned, he was not known for being a man of character. He was known for being a man of power. He had friends in the powerful Jewish community. He had friends among the Romans. But as a man, he was not a man who, who showed love for others. In fact, he was known as ruthless and brutal. As Scripture shows us, he is the one who was responsible for the murder of the innocents. The one who put to death hundreds of thousands of little boys to protect his throne. As Josephus tells us, this man not only was willing to put to, get, put to death strangers, but he put to get death members of his own family, sometimes even his own children, so that he might keep his throne. Herod may have been known as Herod the Great, but he was no great man. And when he saw this, this little baby being, heard of this little baby being born, as he saw the joy and excitement that these magi, these men from the east, these astrologers had, fear took over his heart. Fear for his throne. Now he wasn't all bad, lest I leave you thinking that Herod was only bad, because he also was the one who had the great building project, the one who built the second temple, the beautiful second temple, but that doesn't change his character, does it? So often people do many wonderful things on the outside, but really the measure of their character is what they do behind closed doors, what they do to those who are less than them. Under Herod's reign, he certainly demonstrated himself as a powerful king. But he was not the king who was going to defeat the king, the greatest king. See, Herod looked on the king with fear. He looked on the king as with worry and he called together the chief priests and the teachers of the law hoping that they would give him a different message. But here they even fulfill, showed that fulfillment of prophecy as well. But even they didn't get it either, did they? It took the recognition of pagans. Matthew does this all the time actually in his gospel. As we look at Matthew's gospel, he sets people ag- up against one another, contradictions if you will. Here we had Herod, who was a professed Jew, even though he was actually an Edomite. He, he was one of the Jewish religion. We had the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, those who were supposed to know better. And they didn't recognize their king. But pagans, astrologers from another land, recognized who this king was. Who this king was among the people. They recognized that he was not a king who was going to have an earthly kingdom. They recognized that he was not a king who was going to establish a a major army on this earth who was going to trample over others. But this was a king who was different. This was a king who was born humbly, not in a palace, not in a place of worship, but in a manger. This was a king who was born to common people, to people, Joseph, who worked with his hands. This was a king who, as much as he's unexpected, was the greatest king. And who recognized him? 
Who recognized him? Who worshipped him? Shepherds? Magi? And we do. Maybe sometimes we don't like to be counted in that category. Maybe sometimes we think that that category is not necessarily the ones, the crowds that we want, around, want, around, want to run around with until we look on that king. And we know that, that we don't have to ask the question of what child is this? Who is this child? Because we know that this is the king of the Jews as was hung above his head, as he was pierced, as his hands were pierced on the cross. We know that this is the king who gave his life for his people. This is the king who is the king above all other kings, the Almighty. He wasn't seeking the authority and power from us because he already had it. He wasn't seeking the designs and, the, and, uh, and, the, and the, these great cloths, these great riches, these great foods, these great places, because he didn't need them. He, w- he is the King of kings, and that is Christ our Savior. Christ our Savior, who is the king who is different than every other king. He is a king that does not rule with power and with and putting us under his thumb, but he rules with compassion and with love. And what does it mean that our God rules us with compassion and love? It means that he has forgiven us, that he is forgiving of us, even when we fail to worship him. He is forgiving of us, and he shows, our love to, shows his love to us, even when we fail to show love to him. He is the king who is with us each and every day, whether or not we deserve it. He is the king that instead of taxing us, has been the tax for us. And he is the king who continues to reign to this very day. Now sometimes it's hard to see that reign, isn't it? Sometimes we hear those words of Paul in Philippians chapter 2, but we, we hear them with questions. In Philippians 2, Paul said, At the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we hear words like that from Paul. And they're meant to strengthen us, meant to encourage us. But so often, we struggle to see the victories of our King. We struggle to see the victory of our King in in this life and in the life that is to come. We struggle because we're so much surrounded by the victories of the devil. At times we see his victories and we think, how on earth could God be winning? How on earth could our Savior, our Lord, be winning when we have seen so many victories by the devil? Victories in our, in our world where we see continued hate among other people. Hate carried out in some very, very awful ways. We see victories in our communities. As we, see, as we hear about families who have lost their loved ones to drug addiction, Sons and daughters who are too young to die. We see this in our communities as we see people, even the hate carried out there in our schools where tolerance is king instead of truth. We see this message and we see these victories even among our families. And not just in the fights that we have with our loved ones, but as we see our loved ones leaving the church, turning their back on the message of salvation. And we see these victories in, even in our own lives. And these are the hardest victories to look at, aren't they? These are the hardest victories to look at because we, when we look at these victories, we see that at times that we have not even put up a fight against Satan. We have not even put up a fight against his devices in our lives. At times we allow him to just run rampant. And we know that we are sinful people. We know that we have sins that we that we wouldn't want to talk about in front of any other person. We know that we have sins that we have committed. That, we w- that others would be aghast if they heard. And so we l- look on. And we think that Satan's got a stronghold. We look on and we think that, he's got, that he is victorious. And maybe we even wonder at times, how could God fight back against this? How could God be in control if all these things are happening in our lives? How could God be the one who is ruler and who is almighty? all-powerful when we hear another siren go past us, another ambulance of someone who is sick, who is hurt or in need. You know, when we think about it, it's hard to see those victories at time, isn't it? It's hard to see those victories in our lives. And so we turn back to that manger. We turn back 
to that manger, that humble manger, and we see a king who did not declare victory in the way that we expect, but he declared victory in his own death on the cross. He declared victory in what, what, what others thought were a loss. And he declared victory not just once and for all, but he declared victory for each and every day of our lives. He declared victory even in our world where we see hate continuing to crop up and yet we see people who are coming to know the knowledge of the truth. We see victories in our communities as we see people reaching out to share with those who they care about, with those who are in need. We see victories in our schools as we see, as we see kids continuing to get together and to pray together and to share in the faith together. We see victories in our families as, as those who have been estranged from one another, that crazy aunt or uncle is now we welcome back with open arms. We see victories in our own lives, as we see God destroying the sin around us, inside of us. No, Satan wants us to believe that the battle's already lost. Satan wants us to believe that the war is over and that the King Herods of this world has won, have won and that he has won and that there is no sense in fighting any longer. But our God has told us something different. He has said that he is with us and that his Holy Spirit is with us and that he is there and he will win that there is no chance that he will lose. But he has already won. Because on that cross, he declared the victory that would not be shaken. He declared the victory and he went down into hell and he stormed the, stormed the gates of hell and he said, I have won and I have bought my people with my blood and I have redeemed them. And he has won our salvation, not just for somebody, but for you and for me. He has won salvation so that each one of us can kneel down beside the Magi, that kneel down and worship our King, the true King who is a King of compassion, who is a King of love, who is a King of mercy, who is a King who is different in this world and out of this world, but still in our hearts. That is the King of our salvation. That is our King who we worship. And we hear those words of Paul, not just those words that every knee shall bow, but we hear some other words too, some words of encouragement that he gives us in Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. God works His good in this world. God works His good in this life. And when we open our eyes to see it, we will see the good that He is working. We will see the lives He is changing. We will see the hearts that He is melting so that they might confess their sins and return to Him. For we know that He has melted our hearts. He has turned us from our sins. And He has made us holy. And He has sent us forth. He has sent us forth to share that good news. To share that message of salvation. Not as people who will beat others over the head with it. We know that it doesn't work that way. But as people who share that same love and compassion that our God has shown to us. He has given us a mission to sh spread the message. To spread that message with compassion. To spread that message with hope to spread that message with consolation. The Magi, they followed a star. They followed a star to come to the King. God has sent us. He has sent us to be the light to the nations. He has sent us to be the light to the world, to shine brightly in the lives of our families, to shine brightly in the lives of our communities, to shine brightly in the lives of our world, so that all may come to know that Christ our Lord is King. Amen. Please pray with me. Christ Jesus, we give thanks to you. We give thanks to you for coming into our world, for destroying sin and destroying death. We give thanks to you that you are all powerful and that even as Satan believes he is winning, that you have declared victory. Lord, we know that even in the sickness and disease of this life, even in the pain and loss of this life, even in the hatred of this life and the sins of this world, we know that you are there. And that you are continuing to declare your victory. That you are there and that you have declared victory once and for all. You did not do it from a throne, but from a cross. You declared that victory so that we might know the assurance of our salvation. Lord, we pray that each and every day this assurance may live in our hearts and live in our lives. That we may not be afraid, but that we may with boldness and with assurance share that good news. That we may be those who share the light this epiphany light with all people, that all may come to know that you are our Savior, that you are our King, and that one day we will be with you forever. And so it is in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.